Chapter Seven of the Life Everlasting by Marie Corelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lisa Statler. Memories. Perfect happiness is the soul's acceptance of a sense of joy without question. And this is what I felt through all my being on that never to be forgotten night. Just as a tree may be glad of the soft wind blowing its leaves, or a daisy in the grass may rejoice in the warmth of the sun to which it opens its golden heart, without either being able to explain the delicious ecstasy, so I was the recipient of light and exquisite felicity, which could have no explanation or analysis. I did not try to think. It was enough for me simply to be. I realized, of course, that with the Harlands and their two paid attendants, the materialist Dr. Braille and the secretarial machine Swinton, Raphael Santoris could have nothing in common. And as I know by daily experience that not even the most trifling event happens without a predestined cause for its occurrence, and a purpose in its result. I was sure that the reason for his coming into touch with us at all was to be found in connection, through some mysterious intuition, with myself. However, as I say, I did not think about it. I was content to breathe the invigorating air of peace and serenity in which my spirit seemed to float on wings. I slept like a child who was only tired out with play and pleasure. I woke like a child to whom the world is all new and brim full of beauty. That it was a sunny day seemed right and natural. Clouds and rain could hardly have penetrated the brilliant atmosphere in which I lived and moved. It was an atmosphere of my own creating, of course, and therefore not liable to be disturbed by storms, unless I chose. It is possible for every human being to live in the sunshine of the soul, whatever may be the material surroundings of the body. The so-called practical person would have said to me, Why are you happy? There is no real cause for this sudden elation. You think you have met someone who is in sympathy with your tastes, ideas, and feelings. But you may be quite wrong, and this bright wave of joy into which you are plunging heedlessly, may fling you bruised and broken on a desolate shore for the remainder of your life. One would think you had fallen in love at first sight. To which I should have replied that there is no such thing as falling in love at first sight, that the very expression falling in love conveys a false idea, and that what the world generally calls love is not love at all. Moreover, there was nothing in my heart or mind with regard to Raphael Santoris save a keen interest and sense of friendship. I was sure that his beliefs were the same as mine, and that he had been working along the same lines which I had endeavored to follow. And just as two musicians, inspired by a mutual love of their art, may be glad to play their instruments together in time and tune, even so, I felt that he and I had met on a plane of thought where we had both for a long time been separately wandering. The dream yacht, with its white sails spread ready for a cruise, was as beautiful by day in the sunshine under a blue sky as by night with its own electric radiance flashing its outline against the stars, and I was eager to be on board. We were, however, delayed by an attack of nerves on the part of Catherine, who during the morning was seized with a violent fit of hysteria, to which she completely gave way, sobbing, laughing, and gasping for breath in a manner which showed her to be quite unhinged, and swept from self-control. Dr. Braille took her at once in charge, while Mr. Harland fumed and fretted, pacing up and down in the saloon with an angry face and brooding eyes. He looked at me where I stood, waiting, ready dressed for the excursion of the day, and said, I'm sorry for all this worry, 
Catherine gets worse and worse. Her nerves tear her to pieces. She allows them to do so, I answered, and Dr. Braille allows her to give them their way. He shrugged his shoulders. You don't like Braille, he said, but he's clever, and he does his best. To keep his patience, I hinted with a smile. He turned on his heel and faced me. Well, now, come, he said. Could you cure her? I could have cured her in the beginning, I replied, but hardly now. No one can cure her now but herself. He paced up and down again. She won't be able to go with us to visit Santoris, he said. I'm sure of that. Shall we put it off? I suggested. His eyebrows went up in surprise at me. Why, no, certainly not. It will be a change for you and a pleasure of which I would not deprive you. Besides, I want to go myself. But Catherine... Dr. Braille here entered the saloon with his softest step and most professional manner. Miss Harland is better now, he said. She will be quite calm in a few minutes. But she must remain quiet. It will not be safe for her to attempt any excursion today. Well, that need not prevent the rest of us from going, said Mr. Harland. Oh, no, certainly not. In fact, Miss Harland said she hoped you would go and make her excuses to Mr. Santoris. I shall, of course, be in attendance on her. You won't come, then? And an unconscious look of relief brightened Mr. Harland's features. And as Swinton doesn't wish to join us, we shall be only a party of three. Captain Derrick, myself, and our little friend here. We may as well be off. Is the boat ready? We were informed that Mr. Santoris had sent his own boat and men to fetch us, and that they had been waiting for some few minutes. We at once prepared to go, and while Mr. Harland was getting his overcoat and searching for his field glasses, Dr. Braille spoke to me in a low tone. The truth of the matter is that Miss Harland has been greatly upset by the visit of Mr. Santoris and by some of the things he said last night. She could not sleep and was exceedingly troubled in her mind by the most distressing thoughts. I am very glad she has decided not to see him again today. Do you consider his influence harmful? I queried, somewhat amused. I consider him not quite sane, Dr. Braille answered, coldly. And highly nervous persons like Miss Harland are best without the society of clever but wholly irresponsible theorists. The color burned in my cheeks. You include me in that category, of course, I said quietly. For I said last night that if Mr. Santoris was mad, then I am too, for I hold the same views. He smiled a superior smile. There is no harm in you, he answered condescendingly. You may think what you like. You are only a woman. Very clever, very charming, and full of the most delightful fancies, but weighted fortunately, with the restrictions of your sex. I mean no offense, I assure you. But a woman's views, whatever they are, are never accepted by rational beings. I laughed. I see. And rational beings must always be men, I said. You are quite certain of that? In the fact that men ordain the world's government and progress, you have your answer, he replied. Alas, poor world, I murmured. Sometimes it rebels against the rationalism of its rulers. Just then Mr. Harland called me, and I hastened to join him and Captain Derrick. The boat, which was waiting for us, was manned by four sailors, who wore white jerseys trimmed with scarlet, bearing the name of the yacht to which they belonged, the Dream. These men were dark-skinned and dark-eyed. We took them at first for Portuguese or Malays, but they turned out to be from Egypt. They saluted us, but did not speak, and as soon as we were seated, pulled swiftly away across the water. Captain Derrick watched their movements with great interest and curiosity. "'Plenty of grit in those chaps,' he said, aside to Mr. Harland. "'Look at their muscular arms. I suppose they don't speak a word of English.' Mr. Harland thereupon tried one of them with a remark about the weather. The man smiled and the sudden gleam of his white teeth gave a wonderful light and charm 
to his naturally grave cast of countenance. "'Beautiful day,' he said. "'Very happy sky!' This expression, happy sky, attracted me. It recalled to my mind a phrase I had once read in the translation of an inscription found in an Egyptian sarcophagus. The peace of the morning befriend thee, and the light of the sunset, and the happiness of the sky. The words rang in my ears with an odd familiarity, like the verse of some poem loved and learned by heart in childhood. In a very few minutes we were alongside the dream, and soon on board, where Rafael Santoris received us with kindly courtesy and warmth of welcome. He expressed polite regret at the absence of Miss Harland, none for that of Dr. Braille or Mr. Swinton, and then introduced us to his captain, an Italian named Marino Fazio, of whom Santoris said to us smilingly, He is a scientist as well as a skipper, and he needs to be both in the management of such a vessel as this. He will take Captain Derrick in his charge, and explain to him the mystery of our brilliant appearance at night and also the secret of our sailing without wind. Fazio saluted and smiled a cheerful response. Are you ready to start now? he asked, speaking very good English, with just the slightest trace of a foreign accent. Perfectly! Fazio lifted his hand with a sign to the man at the wheel. Another moment and the yacht began to move. Without the slightest noise, Without the grinding of ropes, or rattling of chains, or creaking boards, she swung gracefully round, and began to glide through the water with a swiftness that was almost incredible. The sails filled, though the air was intensely warm and stirless, an air in which any ordinary schooner would have been hopelessly becalmed. And almost before we knew it, we were out of Loch Scavig, and flying as though borne on the wings of some great white bird all along the wild and picturesque coast of Skye towards Loch Brackadale. One of the most remarkable features about the yacht was the extraordinary lightness with which she skimmed the waves. She seemed to ride on their surface rather than part them with her keel. Everything on board expressed the finest taste, as well as the most perfect convenience, and I saw Mr. Harland gazing about him in utter amazement at the elegant sumptuousness of his surroundings. Santoris showed us all over the vessel, talking to us with the ease of quite an old friend. "'You know the familiar axiom,' he said. "'Anything worth doing at all is worth doing well. The dream was first of all nothing but a dream in my brain, till I set to work with Fazio and made it a reality. Owing to our discovery of the way in which to compel the waters to serve us as our motive power, we have no blackening smoke or steam, so that our furniture and fittings are preserved from dinginess and tarnish. It was possible to have the saloon delicately painted, as you see. Here he opened the door of the apartment mentioned, and we stepped into it as into a fairy palace. It was much loftier than the usual yacht saloon, and on all sides the windows were oval-shaped, set in between the most exquisitely painted panels of sea pieces, evidently the work of some great artist. Overhead the ceiling was draped with pale turquoise blue silk forming a canopy, which was gathered in rich folds on all four sides, having in its center a crystal lamp in the shape of a star. "'You live like a king,' then said Mr. Harland, a trifle bitterly. "'You know how to use your father's fortune.' "'My father's fortune was made to be used,' answered Santoris, with perfect good humour. "'And I think he is perfectly satisfied with my mode of expending it. "'But very little of it has been touched. I have made my own fortune.' "'Indeed? How?' And Harland looked as he evidently felt, keenly interested." Ha, that's asking too much of me, laughed Santoris. You may be satisfied, however, that it's not through defrauding my neighbors. It's comparatively easy to be rich if you have coaxed any of Mother Nature's secrets out of her. She is very kind to her children if they are kind to her. In fact, she spoils them, for the more they ask of her, the more she gives. Besides, every man should make his own money, even if he inherits wealth. 
it is the only way to feel worthy of a place in this beautiful ever-working world he preceded us out of the saloon and showed us the staterooms of which there were five daintily furnished in white and blue and white and rose these are for my guests when i have any he said which is very seldom this for a princess if ever one should honour me with her presence and he opened a door on his right through which we peered into a long lovely room gleaming with iridescent hues and sparkling with touches of gold and crystal the bed was draped with cloudy lace through which a shimmer of pale rose colour made itself visible and the carpet of dark moss green formed a perfect setting for the quaintly shaped furniture which was all of sandalwood inlaid with ivory on a small table of carved ivory in the centre of the room lay a bunch of madonna lilies tied with a finely twisted cord of gold we murmured our admiration and santoris addressed himself directly to me for the first time since we had come on board will you go in and rest for a while till luncheon he said i placed the lilies there for your acceptance the colour rushed to my cheeks i looked up at him in a little wonderment but i am not a princess his eyes smiled down into mine no then i must have dreamed you were my heart gave a quick throb some memory touched my brain but what it was i could not tell mr harland glanced at me and laughed what did i tell you the other day he said did i not call you the princess of a fairy tale i was not far wrong they left me to myself then and as i stood alone in the beautiful room which had thus been placed at my disposal a curious feeling came over me that these luxurious surroundings were after all not new to my experience i had been accustomed to them for a great part of my life stay how foolish of me a great part of my life then what part of it i briefly reviewed my own career a difficult and solitary childhood the hard and uphill work which became my lot as soon as i was old enough to work at all incessant study and certainly no surplus of riches then where had i known luxury i sank into a chair dreamily considering the floating scent of sandalwood and the perfume of lilies commingled was like the breath of an odorous garden in the east familiar to me long ago and as i sat musing i became conscious of a sudden inrush of power and sense of dominance which lifted me as it were above myself as though i had without any warning been given the full control of a great kingdom and its people catching sight of my own reflection in an opposite mirror i was startled and almost afraid at the expression of my face the proud light in my eyes the smile on my lips what am i thinking of i said half aloud i am not my true self to-day some remnant of a cast-off pride has arisen in me and made me less of a humble student i must not yield to this overpowering demand on my soul it is surely an evil suggestion which asserts itself like the warning pain or fever of an impending disease can it be the influence of santoris no i will never believe it and yet a vague uneasiness beset me and i rose and paced about restlessly then pausing where the lovely madonna lilies lay on the ivory table i remembered they had been put there for me i raised them gently inhaling their delicious fragrance and as i did so saw lying immediately underneath them a golden cross of a mystic shape i knew well its upper half set on the face of a seven-pointed star also of gold with joy i took it up and kissed it reverently and as i compared it with the one i always secretly wore on my own person i knew that all was well and that i need have no distrust of raphael santoris no injurious effect on my mind could possibly be exerted by his influence and i was thrown back on myself for a clue to that singular wave of feeling so entirely contrary to my own disposition which had for a moment overwhelmed me 
I could not trace its source, but I speedily conquered it. Fastening one of the snowy lilies in my waistband, as a contrast to the bright bit of bell heather which I cherished even more than if it were a jewel, I presently went up on deck, where I found my host, Mr. Harland, Captain Derrick, and Marino Fazio all talking animatedly together. "'The mystery is cleared up,' said Mr. Harland, addressing me as I approached. "'Captain Derrick is satisfied. He has learned how one of the finest schooners he has ever seen can make full speed in any weather without wind.' "'Oh, no, I haven't learned how to do it. I'm a long way off that.' said Derrick, good-humouredly. But I've seen how it's done, and it's marvellous, if that invention could be applied to all ships. Ah, but first of all, it would be necessary to instruct the shipbuilders, put in Fazio. They would have to learn their trade all over again. Our yacht looks as though she were built on the same lines as all yachts, but you know, you have seen, she is entirely different. Captain Derrick gave a nod of grave emphasis. Santoris, meantime, had come to my side. Our glances met. He saw that I had received and understood the message of the lilies, and a light and color came into his eyes that made them beautiful. "'Men have not yet fully enjoyed their heritage,' he said, taking up the conversation. "'Our yacht's motive power seems complex, but in reality it is very simple.' and the same force which propels this light vessel would propel the biggest liner afloat. Nature has given us all the materials for every kind of work and progress, physical and mental, but because we do not at once comprehend them, we deny their uses. Nothing in the air, earth, or water exists which we may not press into our service, and it is in the study of natural forces that we find our conquest. What hundreds of years it took us to discover the wonders of steam! How the discoverer was mocked and laughed at! Yet it was not really wonderful. It was always there, waiting to be employed, and wasted by mere lack of human effort. One can say the same of electricity, sometimes called miraculous. It is no miracle, but perfectly common and natural. Only we have, until now, failed to apply it to our needs. And even when wider disclosures of science are being made to us every day, we still bar knowledge by obstinacy, and remain in ignorance rather than learn. A few grains in weight of hydrogen have power enough to raise a million tons to a height of more than three hundred feet. And if we could only find a way to liberate economically, and with discretion, the various forces which spirit and matter contain, we might change the whole occupation of man and make of him less a laborer than thinker, less mortal than angel. The wildest fairy tales might come true, and earth be transformed into a paradise. And as for motive power, in a thimbleful of concentrated fuel, we might take the largest ship across the widest ocean. I say, if we could only find a way. Some think they are finding it. You, for example, suggested Mr. Harland. He laughed. I, if you like, for example, will you come to luncheon? He led the way, and Mr. Harland and I followed. Captain Derrick, who I saw was a little afraid of him, had arranged to take his luncheon with Fazio and the other officers of the crew apart. We were waited upon by dark-skinned men attired in their picturesque costume of the East, who performed their duties with noiseless grace and swiftness. The yacht had for some time slackened speed, and appeared to be merely floating lazily on the surface of the calm water. We were told she could always do this and make almost imperceptible headway, provided there was no impending storm in the air. It seemed as if we were scarcely moving, and the whole atmosphere surrounding us expressed the most delicious tranquillity. The luncheon prepared for us was of the daintiest and most elegant description, and Mr. Harland, who, on account of his ill health, seldom had any appetite, enjoyed it with a zest and heartiness I had never seen him display before. He particularly appreciated the wine, a rich, ruby-colored beverage, which was unlike anything I had ever tasted. 
there is nothing remarkable about it said santoris when questioned as to its origin it is simply real wine though you may say that of itself is remarkable there being none in the market it is the pure juice of the grape prepared in such a manner as to nourish the blood without inflaming it it can do you no harm in fact for you harland it is an excellent thing why for me in particular queried harland rather sharply because you need it answered santoris my dear fellow you are not in the best of health and you will never get better under your present treatment i looked up eagerly that is what i too have thought i said only i dare not express it mr harland surveyed me with an amused smile dared not i know nothing you would not dare but with all your boldness you are full of mere theories and theories never made an ill man well yet santoris exchanged a swift glance with me then he spoke theory without practice is of course useless he said but surely you can see that this lady has reached a certain plane of thought on which she herself dwells in health and content and can she not serve you as an object lesson not at all replied mr harland almost testily she is a woman whose life has been immersed in study and contemplation and because she has allowed herself to forgo many of the world's pleasures she can be made happy by a mere nothing a handful of roses or the sound of sweet music are they nothings interrupted santoris to business men they are and business itself is it not also from some points of view a nothing santoris if you are going to be transcendental i will have none of you said mr harland with a vexed laugh what i wish to say is merely this that my little friend here for whom i have a great esteem let me assure her is not really capable of forming an opinion of the condition of a man like myself nor can she judge of the treatment likely to benefit me she does not even know the nature of my illness but i can see that she has taken a dislike to my physician braille i never take dislikes mr harland i interrupted quickly i merely trust to a guiding instinct which tells me when a man is sincere or when he is acting a part that's all well you've decided that braille is not sincere he replied and you hardly think him clever but if you would consider the point logically you might inquire what motive could he possibly have for playing the humbug with me santoris smiled oh man of business you can ask that we were at the end of luncheon the servants had retired and mr harland was sipping his coffee and smoking a cigar you can ask that he repeated you a millionaire with one daughter who is your sole heiress can ask what motive a man like braille worldly calculating and without heart has in keeping you both both i say you and your daughter equally in his medical clutches mr harland's sharp eyes flashed with a sudden menace if i thought he began then he broke off presently he resumed you are not aware of the true state of affairs santoris wizard and scientist as you are you cannot know everything i need constant medical attendance and my disease is incurable no said santoris quietly not incurable a sudden hope illumined harland's worn and haggard face not incurable but my good fellow you don't even know what it is i do i also know how it began and when how it has progressed and how it will end i know too how it can be checked cut off in its development and utterly destroyed but the cure would depend on yourself more than on dr braille or any other physician at present no good is being done and much harm for instance you are in pain now i am but how can you tell by the small almost imperceptible lines on your face which contract quite unconsciously to yourself i can stop that dreary suffering at once for you if you will let me oh i will let you certainly 
and Mr. Harland smiled incredulously. But I think you overestimate your abilities. I was never a boaster, replied Santoris cheerfully. But you shall keep whatever opinion you like of me. And he drew from his pocket a tiny crystal file, set in a sheath of gold. A touch of this in your glass of wine will make you feel a new man. We watched him with strained attention as he carefully allowed two small drops of liquid, bright and clear as dew, to fall one after the other into Mr. Harland's glass. Now, he continued, drink without fear, and say good-bye to all pain for at least forty-eight hours. With a docility quite unusual to him, Mr. Harland obeyed. May I go on smoking? he asked. You may. A minute passed, and Mr. Harland's face expressed a sudden surprise and relief. "'Well, what now?' asked Santoris. "'How is the pain?' "'Gone!' he answered. "'I can hardly believe it. But I'm bound to admit it.' "'That's right. And it will not come back. Not today, at any rate. Nor tomorrow. Shall we go on deck now?' We assented. As we left the saloon, he said, you must see the glow of the sunset over Loch Korisk. It's always a fine sight, and it promises to be specially fine this evening. There are so many picturesque clouds floating about. We are turning back to Loch Skavig, and when we get there we can land and do the rest of the excursion on foot. It's not much of a climb. Will you feel equal to it? This question he put to me personally. I smiled. Of course, I feel equal to anything. Besides, I've been very lazy on board the Diana, taking no real exercise. A walk will do me good. Mr. Harland seated himself in one of the long reclining chairs, which were placed temptingly under an awning on deck. His eyes were clearer and his face more composed than I had ever seen it. Those drops you gave me are magical, Santoris, he said. I wish you'd let me have a supply. Santoris stood looking down upon him kindly. "'It would not be safe for you,' he answered. "'The remedy is a sovereign one if used very rarely and with extreme caution. But in uninstructed hands it is dangerous. Its work is to stimulate certain cells. At the same time, like all things taken in excess, it can destroy them. Moreover, it would not agree with Dr. Braille's medicines.' You really and truly think Braille an impostor? Impostor is a strong word. No, I will give him credit for believing in himself up to a certain point. But of course, he knows that the so-called electric treatment he is giving to your daughter is perfectly worthless, just as he knows that she is not really ill. Not really ill? Mr. Harland almost bounced up in his chair while I felt a secret thrill of satisfaction. Why, she's been a miserable, querulous invalid for years. Since she broke off her engagement to a worthless rascal, said Santoris calmly, you see, I know all about it. I listened, astonished. How did he know, how could he know, the intimate details of a life like Catherine's, which could scarcely be of interest to a man such as he was? Your daughter's trouble is written on her face, he went on warped affections, slain desires, disappointed hopes, and neither the strength nor the will to turn these troubles into blessings. Therefore they resemble an army of malarious germs which are eating away her moral fiber. Braille knows that what she needs is the belief that someone has an interest, not only in her, but in the particularly morbid view she has taught herself to take of life. He is actively showing that interest. The rest is easy, and will be easier when, well, when you are gone. Mr. Harland was silent, drawing slow whiffs from his cigar. After a long pause, he said, You are prejudiced, and I think you are mistaken. You only saw the man for a few minutes last night, and you know nothing of him. Nothing except what he is bound to reveal, answered Santoris. What do you mean? You will not believe me if I tell you. And Santoris, drawing a chair close to mine, sat down. 
yet i am sure this lady who is your friend and guest will corroborate what i say though of course you will not believe her in fact my dear harland as you have schooled yourself to believe nothing why urge me to point out a truth you decline to accept had you lived in the time of galileo you would have been one of his torturers i ask you to explain said mr harland with a touch of pique whether i accept your explanation or not is my own affair quite agreed santoris with a slight smile as i told you long ago at oxford a man's life is his own affair entirely he can do what he likes with it but he can no more command the result of what he does with it than the sun can conceal its rays each individual human being male and female alike moves unconsciously in the light of self-revealment as though all his or her faults and virtues were reflected like the colors in a prism or were set out in a window for passers-by to gaze upon fortunately for the general peace of society however most passers-by are not gifted with the sight to see the involuntary display you speak in enigmas said harland impatiently and i'm not good at guessing them santoris regarded him fixedly his eyes were luminous and compassionate the simplest truths are to you enigmas he said regretfully a pity it is so you ask me what i mean when i say a man is bound to reveal himself the process of self-revealment accompanies self-existence as much as the fragrance of a rose accompanies its opening petals you can never detach yourself from your own enveloping aura neither in body nor in soul christ taught this when he said let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father which is in heaven your light remember that word light is not used here as a figure of speech but as a statement of fact a positive light surrounds you it is exhaled and produced by your physical and moral being and those among us who have cultivated their inner organs of vision see it before they see you it can be of the purest radiance equally it can be a mere nebulous film but whatever the moral and physical condition of the man or woman concerned it is always shown in the aura which each separate individual expresses for himself or herself in this way dr braille reveals his nature to me as well as the chief tendency of his thoughts in this way you reveal yourself and your present state of health it is a proved test that cannot go wrong mr harland listened with his usual air of cynical tolerance and incredulity i have heard this sort of nonsense before he said i have even read in otherwise reliable scientific journals about the auras of people affecting us with antipathies or sympathies for or against them but it's a merely fanciful suggestion and has no foundation in reality why did you wish me to explain then asked santoris i can only tell you what i know and what i see harland moved restlessly holding his cigar between his fingers and looking at it curiously to avoid as i thought the steadfast brilliancy of the compelling eyes that were fixed upon him these auras he went on indifferently are nothing but suppositions i grant you that certain discoveries are being made concerning the luminosity of trees and plants which in some states of the atmosphere give out rays of light but that human beings do the same i decline to believe of course and santoris leaned back in his chair easily as though at once dismissing the subject from his mind a man born blind must needs decline to believe in the pleasures of sight harland's wrinkled brow deepened its furrow in a frown do you mean to tell me do you dare to tell me he said that you see any aura as you call it round my personality i do most assuredly answered santoris i see it as distinctly as i see yourself in the midst of it but there is no actual light in it it is a mere grey mist a mist of miasma 
thank you and harland laughed harshly you are complimentary is it a time for compliments asked santoris with sudden sternness harland would you have me tell you all harland's face grew livid he threw up his hand with a warning gesture no he said almost violently he clutched the arm of his chair with a nervous grip and for one instant looked like a hunted creature caught red-handed in some act of crime recovering himself quickly he forced a smile what about our little friend's aura he queried glancing at me does she express herself in radiance santoris did not reply for a moment then he turned his eyes toward me almost wistfully she does he answered i wish you could see her as i see her there was a moment's silence my face grew warm and i was vaguely embarrassed but i met his gaze fully and frankly and i wish i could see myself as you see me i said half laughingly for i am not in the least aware of my own aura it is not intended that any one should be visibly aware of it in their own personality he answered but i think it is right we should realize the existence of these radiant or cloudy exhalations which we ourselves weave around ourselves so that we may walk in the light as children of the light his voice sank to a grave and tender tone which checked mr harland in something he was evidently about to say for he bit his lip and was silent i rose from my chair and moved away then looking from the smooth deck of the dream shadowed by her full white sails out to the peaks of the majestic hills whose picturesque beauties are sung in the wild strains of ossian and the projecting crags deep hollows and lofty pinnacles outlining the coast with its numerous waterfalls lochs and shadowy creeks a thin and delicate haze of mist hung over the land like a pale violet veil through which the sun shot beams of rose and gold giving a vaporous unsubstantial effect to the scenery as though it were gliding with us like a cloud pageant on the surface of the calm water the shores of loch scavig began to be dimly seen in the distance and presently captain derrick approached mr harland spyglass in hand the diana must have gone for a cruise he said in rather a perturbed way as far as i can make out there's no sign of her where we left her this morning mr harland heard this indifferently perhaps catherine wished for a sail he answered there are plenty on board to manage the vessel you are not anxious oh not at all sir if you are satisfied derrick answered mr harland stretched himself luxuriously in his chair personally i don't mind where the diana has gone for the moment he said with a laugh i'm particularly comfortable where i am santoris here and santoris who had stepped aside to give some order to one of his men came up at the call what do you say to leaving me on board while you and my little friend go and see your sunset effect on loch corisk by yourselves santoris heard this suggestion with an amused look you don't care for sunsets oh yes i do in a way but i've seen so many of them no two alike put in santoris i dare say not still i don't mind missing a few just now i should like a sound sleep rather than a sunset it's very unsociable i know but here he half closed his eyes and seemed inclined to doze off there and then santoris turned to me what do you say can you put up with my company for an hour or two and allow me to be your guide to loch corisk or would you too rather not see the sunset our eyes met a thrill of mingled joy and fear ran through me and again i felt that strange sense of power and dominance which had previously overwhelmed me indeed i have set my heart on going to loch corisk i answered lightly and i cannot let you off your promise to take me there we will leave mr harland to his siesta you're sure you do not mind said harland then 
opening his eyes drowsily. You will be perfectly safe with Santoris. I smiled. I did not need that assurance. And I talked gaily with Captain Derrick on the subject of the Diana and the course of her possible cruise, while he scanned the waters in search of her. And I watched with growing impatience our gradual approach to Loch Scabig, which in the bright afternoon looked scarcely less dreary than at night, especially now that the Diana was no longer there to give some air of human occupation to the wild and barren surroundings. The sun was well inclined toward the western horizon when the dream reached her former moorings and noiselessly dropped anchor, and about twenty minutes later the electric launch belonging to the vessel was lowered and I entered it with Santoris a couple of his men managing the boat as it rushed through the dark steel-colored water to the shore. End of chapter 7、Chapter This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lisa Statler. Visions. The touch of the earth seemed strange to me after nearly a week spent at sea, and as I sprang from the launch on to the rough rocks, aided by Santoris, I was for a moment faint and giddy. The dark mountain summits seemed to swirl round me. And the glittering water, shining like steel, had the weird effect of a great mirror in which a fluttering vision of something undefined and undeclared rose and passed like a breath. I recovered myself with an effort and stood still, trying to control the foolish throbbing of my heart, while my companion gave a few orders to his men in a language which I thought I knew, though I could not follow it. Are you speaking Gaelic? I asked him with a smile. No, only something very like it, Phoenician. He looked straight at me as he said this, and his eyes, darkly blue and brilliant, expressed a world of suggestion. He went on. All this country was familiar ground to the Phoenician colonists of ages ago. I am sure you know that. The Gaelic tongue is the genuine dialect of the ancient Phoenician Celtic, and when I speak the original language to a Highlander who only knows his native Gaelic, he understands me perfectly. I was silent. We moved away from the shore, walking slowly side by side. Presently I paused, looking back at the launch we had just left. Your men are not Highlanders? No, they are from Egypt. But surely, I said with some hesitation, Phoenician is no longer known or spoken. Not by the world of ordinary men, he answered. I know it and speak it, and so do most of those who serve me. You have heard it before, only you do not quite remember. I looked at him, startled. He smiled, adding gently, Nothing dies, not even a language. We were not yet out of sight of the men. They had pushed the launch offshore again and were starting it back to the yacht, it being arranged that they should return for us in a couple of hours. We were following a path among slippery stones near a rushing torrent. But as we turned round a sharp bend, we lost the view of Loch Scavig itself and were for the first time truly alone. Huge mountains, crowned with jagged pinnacles, surrounded us on all sides. Here and there, tufts of heather clinging to the large masses of dark stone blazed rose purple in the declining sunshine. The hollow sound of the falling stream made a perpetual crooning music in our ears, and the warm, stirless air seemed breathless, as though hung in suspense above us, waiting for the echo of some word or whisper that should betray a life's secret. Such a silence held us that it was almost unbearable. Every nerve in my body seemed like a strained harp string ready to snap at a touch, and yet I could not speak. 
I tried to get the mastery over the rising tide of thought, memory, and emotion that surged in my soul like a tempest. Swiftly and peremptorily, I argued with myself that the extraordinary chaos of my mind was only due to my own imaginings. Nevertheless, despite my struggles, I remained caught, as it were, in a web that imprisoned every faculty and sense, a web fine as gossamer, yet unbreakable as iron. In a kind of desperation, I raised my eyes, burning with the heat of restrained tears, and saw Santoris watching me with patient, almost appealing tenderness. I felt that he could read my unexpressed trouble, and involuntarily I stretched out my hands to him. "'Tell me,' I half whispered, "'what is it I must know? We are strangers, and yet—' He caught my hands in his own. "'Not strangers,' he said, his voice trembling a little. "'You cannot say that. Not strangers, but old friends.' The strong gentleness of his clasp recalled the warm pressure of the invisible hands that had guided me out of darkness in my dream of a few nights past. I looked up into his face, and every line of it became suddenly, startlingly familiar. The deep-set blue eyes, the broad brows and intellectual features, were all as well known to me as might be the portrait of a beloved one to the lover and my heart almost stood still with the wonder and terror of the recognition. Not strangers, he repeated with quiet emphasis, as though to reassure me. Only since we last met we have travelled far asunder. Have yet a little patience. You will presently remember me as well as I remember you. With the rush of startled recollection I found my voice. I remember you now, I said in low, unsteady tones. I have seen you often, often, but where? Tell me where. Oh, surely you know. He still held my hands with the tenderest force, and seemed, like myself, to find speech difficult. If two deeply attached friends, parted for many years, were all unexpectedly to meet in some solitary place where neither had thought to see a living soul, their emotion could hardly be keener than ours, and yet there was an invisible barrier between us, a barrier erected either by him or by myself, something that held us apart. The sudden and overpowering demand made upon our strength by the swift and subtle attraction which drew us together was held in check by ourselves, and it was as if we were each separately surrounded by a circle across which neither of us dared to pass. I looked at him in mingled fear and questioning. His eyes were gravely thoughtful and full of light. Yes, I know, he answered at last, speaking very softly, while gently releasing one of my hands, he held the other. I know, but we need not speak of that. As I have already said, you will remember all by gradual degrees. We are never permitted to entirely forget but it is quite natural that now, at this immediate hour, we should find it strange, you perhaps more than I, that something impels us one to the other, something that will not be gainsaid, something that if all the powers of earth and heaven could intervene, which by the simplest law they cannot, will take no denial. I trembled, not with fear, but with an exquisite delight I dared not pause to analyze he pressed my hand more closely. We had better walk on, he continued, averting his gaze from mine for the moment. If I say more just now, I shall say too much, and you will be frightened, perhaps offended. I have been guilty of so many errors in the past. You must help me to avoid them in the future. Come! And he turned his eyes again upon me with a smile. Let us see the sunset. We moved on for a few moments in absolute silence, he still holding my hand and guiding me up the rough path we followed. The noise of the rushing torrent sounded louder in my ears, sometimes with a clattering insistence, as though it sought to match itself against the surging of my own quick blood 
in an endeavour to drown my thoughts. On we went, and still onward. The path seemed interminable, though it was in reality a very short journey. But there was such a weight of unutterable things pressing on my soul, like a pent-up storm craving for outlet, that every step measured itself as almost a mile. At last we paused. We were in full view of Loch Corisk and its weird splendor. On all sides arose bare and lofty mountains, broken and furrowed here and there by deep hollows and quarries, supremely grand in their impressive desolation, uplifting their stony peaks around us like the walls and turrets of a gigantic fortress and rising so abruptly and so impenetrably encompassing the black stretch of water below that it seemed impossible for a sunbeam to force its shining entrance into such a circle of dense gloom yet there was a shower of golden light pouring aslant down one of the highest of the hills brightening to vivid crimson stray clumps of heather touching into pale green some patches of moss and lichen and giving the dazzling flash of silver to the white wings of a seagull which soared above our heads uttering wild cries like a creature in pain pale blue mists were rising from the surface of the lake and the fitful gusts of air that rushed over the rocky summits played with these impalpable vapours borne inland from the atlantic and tossed them to and fro into fantastic shapes some like flying forms with long hair streaming behind them, some like armed warriors hurtling their spears against each other, and some like veiled ghosts hurrying past as though driven to their land of shadows by shuddering fear. We stood silently, hand in hand, watching the uneasy flitting of these cloud phantoms, and waiting for the deepening glow, which, when it should spread upwards from the rays of the sinking sun, would transform the wild, dark scene to one of almost supernatural splendor. Suddenly Santoris spoke. Now shall I tell you where we last met? he asked very gently. And may I show you the reasons why we meet again? I lifted my eyes to his. My heart beat with suffocating quickness and thoughts were in my brain that threatened to overwhelm my small remaining stock of self-control, and make of me nothing but a creature of tears and passion. I moved my lips in an effort to speak, but no sound came from them. Do not be afraid, he continued in the same quiet tone. It is true that we must be careful now, as in the past we were careless but perfect comprehension of each other rests with ourselves. May I go on? I gave a mute sign of assent. There was a rough crag near us, curiously shaped like a sort of throne and canopy, the canopy being formed by a thickly overhanging mass of rock and heather, and here he made me sit down, placing himself beside me. From this point we commanded a view of the head of the lake and the great mountain which closes and dominates it, and which now began to be illumined with a strange witch-like glow of orange and purple, while a thin mist moved slowly across it like the folds of a ghostly stage curtain preparing to rise and display the first scene of some great drama. Sometimes, he then said, it happens, even in the world of cold and artificial convention, that a man and woman are brought together who, to their own immediate consciousness, have had no previous acquaintance with each other, and yet with the lightest touch, the swiftest glance of an eye, a million vibrations are set quivering in them like harp-strings struck by the hand of a master, and responding each to each in throbbing harmony and perfect tune. They do not know how it happens, they only feel it is then nothing, I repeat this with emphasis, nothing can keep them apart. Soul rushes to soul, heart leaps to heart, and all form and ceremony, custom and usage crumble into dust before the power that overwhelms them. 
these sudden storms of etheric vibration occur every day among the most ordinary surroundings and with the most unlikely persons and society as at present constituted frowns and shakes its head or jeers at what it cannot understand calling such impetuosity folly or worse while remaining wilfully blind to the fact that in the strangest aspect it is nothing but the assertion of an eternal law moreover it is a law that cannot be set aside or broken with impunity just as the one point of vibration sympathetically strikes the other in the system of wireless telegraphy so despite millions and millions of intervening currents and lines of divergence the immortal soul spark strikes its kindred fire across a waste of worlds until they meet in the compelling flash of that god's message called love he paused then went on slowly no force can turn aside one from the other nothing can intervene not because it is either romance or reality but simply because it is a law you understand I bent my head silently. It may be thousands of years before such a meeting is consummated, he continued, for thousands of years are but hours in the eternal countings. Yet in those thousands of years what lives must be lived, what lessons must be learned, what sins committed and expiated, what precious time lost or found, what happiness missed or wasted. His voice thrilled and again he took my hand and held it gently clasped. "'You must believe in yourself alone,' he said. "'If any lurking thought suggests a disbelief in me, it is quite natural that you should doubt me a little. You have studied long and deeply. You have worked hard at problems which puzzle the strongest man's brain. And you have succeeded in many things, because you have kept what most men manage to lose when grappling with science.' faith. You have always studied with an uplifted heart, uplifted towards the things unseen and eternal. But it has been a lonely heart, too, as lonely as mine. A moment's silence followed, a silence that seemed heavy and dark, like a passing cloud, and instinctively I looked up to see if indeed a brooding storm was not above us. A heaven of splendid color met my gaze, the whole sky was lighted with a glory of gold and blue. But below this flaming radiance there was a motionless mass of grey vapour, hanging square, as it seemed, across the face of the lofty mountain at the head of the lake, like a great canvas set ready for an artist's pencil and prepared to receive the creation of his thought. I watched this in a kind of absorbed fascination, conscious that the warm hand holding mine had strengthened its close grasp, when suddenly something sharp and brilliant, like the glitter of a sword or a forked flash of lightning, passed before my eyes with a dizzying sensation, and the lake, the mountains, the whole landscape vanished like a fleeting mirage, and in all the visible air only the heavy curtain of mist remained. I made an effort to move, to speak, in vain, I thought some sudden illness must have seized me, yet no, for the half-swooning feeling that had for a moment unsteadied my nerves had already passed, and I was calm enough. Yet I saw more plainly than I had ever seen anything in visible nature, a slowly moving, slowly passing panorama of scenes and episodes that presented themselves in marvellous outline and colouring pictures that were gradually unrolled and spread out to my view on the grey background of that impalpable mist, which like a shadow hung between myself and impenetrable mystery. And I realized to the full that an eternal record of every life is written not only in sound, but in light, in color, in tune, in mathematical proportion and harmony, and that not a word, not a thought, not in action, is forgotten. A vast forest rose before me. I saw the long shadows of the leafy boughs flung thick upon the sward and the wild tropical vines hanging rope-like from the intertwisted stems. 
a golden moon looked warmly in between the giant branches flooding the darkness of the scene with rippling radiance and within its light two human beings walked a man and woman their arms round each other their faces leaning close together the man seemed pleading with his companion for some favour which she withheld and presently she drew herself away from him altogether with a decided movement of haughty rejection i could not see her face but her attire was regal and splendid and on her head there shone a jewelled diadem her lover stood apart for a moment with bent head then he threw himself on his knees before her and caught her hand in an evident outburst of passionate entreaty and while they stood thus together i saw the phantom-like figure of another woman moving towards them she came directly into the foreground of the picture her white garments clinging round her her fair hair flung loosely over her shoulders and her whole demeanour expressing eagerness and fear as she approached the man sprang up from his knees and with a gesture of fury drew a dagger from his belt and plunged it into her heart i saw her reel back from the blow i saw the red blood well up through the whiteness of her clothing and as she turned towards her murderer with a last look of appeal i recognized my own face in hers and in his the face of santoris i uttered a cry or thought i uttered it a darkness swept over me and the vision vanished another vivid flash struck my eyes and i found myself looking upon the crowded thoroughfares of a great city towers and temples palaces and bridges presented themselves to my gaze in a network of interminable width and architectural splendour moving and swaying before me like a wave glittering with a thousand sparkles uplifted to the light presently this unsteadiness of movement resolved itself into form and order and i became as it were one unobserved spectator among thousands of a scene of picturesque magnificence it seemed that i stood in the enormous audience hall of a great palace where there were crowds of slaves attendants and armed men on all features were calm strong and reposeful expressive of dignity wisdom and power and as i looked more people gathered together i heard strains of solemn music pealing from the temple close by and i saw the solitary woman draw herself farther apart and almost disappear among the shadows the light grew brighter in the east the sun shot a few advancing rays upward suddenly the door of the temple was thrown open and a long procession of priests carrying flaming tapers and attended by boys in white garments and crowned with flowers made their slow and stately way towards the column with the godlike head upon it and began to circle round it chanting as they walked while the flower-crowned boys swung golden censers to and fro impregnating the air with rich perfume the people all knelt and still the priests paced round and round chanting and murmuring prayers till at last the great sun lifted the edge of its glowing disk above the horizon and its rays springing from the east like golden arrows struck the brow of the head set on its basalt pedestal with the sudden glitter of this morning glory the chanting ceased the procession stopped and one priest tall and commanding of aspect stepped forth from the rest holding up his hands to enjoin silence and then the head quivered as with life its lips moved there was a rippling sound like the chord of a harp smitten by the wind and a voice full sweet and resonant spoke aloud the words i face the sunrise with a shout of joy priests and people responded we face the sunrise and he who seemed the highest in authority raising his arms invokingly toward heaven exclaimed even so o mightiest among the mighty let us ever remember that thy shadow is but part of thy light that sorrow is but the passing humour of joy and that death is but the night which dawns again into life we face the sunrise 
then all who were assembled joined in singing a strange half-barbaric song and chorus of triumph to the strains of which they slowly moved off and disappeared like shapes breathed on a mirror and melting away only the tall high priest remained and he stood alone waiting as it were for something eagerly expected and desired and presently the woman who had till now remained hidden among the shadows of the surrounding trees came swiftly forward she was very pale her eyes shone with tears and again i saw my own face in hers the priest turned quickly to greet her, and I distinctly heard every word he spoke as he caught her hands in his own and drew her towards him. "'Everything in this world and the next I will resign,' he said, "'for love of thee, honour, dignity, and this poor earth's renown I lay at thy feet, thou most beloved of women. What other thing created or imagined can be compared to the joy of thee, to the sweetness of thy lips, the softness of thy bosom, the love that trembles into confession with thy smile. Imprison me but in thine arms, and I will count my very soul well lost for an hour of love with thee. Ah, deny me not, turn me not away from thee again. Love comes but once in life, such love as ours, early or late, but once. She looked at him with tender passion and pity a look in which I thankfully saw there was no trace of pride, resentment, or affected injury. Oh, my beloved, she answered, and her voice, plaintive and sweet, thrilled on the silence, like a sob of pain. Why wilt thou rush on destruction for so poor a thing as I am? Knowest thou not? And wilt thou not remember that, to a priest of thy great order, the love of woman is forbidden? and the punishment thereof is death. Already the people view thee with suspicion, and me with scorn. Forbear, O dearest brave soul, be strong. Strong? he echoed. Is it not strong to love? I, the very best of strength, for what avails the power of man if he may not bend a woman to his will? Child, wherever love is, there can be no death, but only life. Love is as the ever-flowing torrent of eternity in my veins, the pulse of everlasting youth and victory. What are the foolish creeds of man compared with this one truth of nature, love? Is not the deity himself the supreme lover? And wouldst thou have me a castaway from his holiest ordinance? Ah, no! Come to me, my beloved, soul of my soul, inmost core of my heart. Come to me in the silence when no one sees and no one hears. Come when... He broke off, checked by her sudden smile and look of rapture. Some thought had evidently, like a ray of light, cleared her doubts away. So be it, she said. I give thee all myself from henceforth. I will come. He uttered an exclamation of relief and joy and drew her closer till her head rested on his breast and her loosened hair fell in a shower across his arms. At last, he murmured, at last, mine, all mine, this tender soul, this passionate heart, mine, this exquisite life, to do with as I will, O oh, crown of my best manhood, when wilt thou come to me? She answered at once, without hesitation. Tonight, she said, tonight, when the moon rises, meet me here in this very place, this sacred grove, where Memnon hears thy vow to him broken, and my vows consecrated to thee. And as I live, I swear I will be all thine. But now, leave me to pray. She lifted her head and looked into his adoring eyes, then kissed him with a strange grave tenderness, as though bidding him farewell, and with a gentle gesture motioned him away. Elated and flushed with joy, he obeyed her sign and left her, disappearing in the same phantom-like way in which all the other figures in this weird dream drama had made their exit. She watched him go with a wistful yearning gaze. Then, in apparent utter desperation, she threw herself on her knees before the impassive head on its rocky pedestal and prayed aloud. 
O hidden and unknown God, whom we poor earthly creatures symbolize, give me the strength to love unselfishly, the patience to endure uncomplainingly. Thou, heart of stone, temper with thy coldest wisdom my poor throbbing heart of flesh. Help me to quell the tempest in my soul, and let me be even as thou art, inflexible, immovable, save when the sun strikes music from thy dreaming brows and tells thee it is day forgive o oh great god forgive the fault of my beloved a fault which is not his but mine merely because i live and he hath found me fair let all be well for him but for me let nothing evermore be either well or ill and teach me even me to face the sunrise her voice ceased a mist came before me for a moment, and when this cleared, the same scene was presented to me under the glimmer of a ghostly moon. And she who looked so like myself lay dead at the foot of the great statue, her hands clasped on her breast, her eyes closed, her mouth smiling as in sleep, while beside her raved and wept her priestly lover, invoking her by every tender name, clasping her lifeless body in his arms, covering her face with useless, passionate kisses, and calling her back with wild grief from the silence into which her soul had fled. And I knew then that she had put all thought of self aside, in a sense of devotion to duty. She had chosen what she imagined to be the only way out of difficulty. To save the honor of her lover, she had slain herself. But, was it wise or foolish? This thought pressed itself insistently home to my mind. She had given her life to serve a mistaken creed. She had bowed to the conventions of a temporary code of human law. Yet, surely God was above all strange and unnatural systems, built up by man for his own immediate convenience, vanity, or advantage. And was not love the nearest thing to God? And if those two souls were destined lovers, could they be divided, even by their own rashness? These questions were curiously urged upon my inward consciousness, as I looked again upon the poor, fragile corpse among the reeds and palms of the sluggishly flowing river, and heard the clamorous despair of the man to whom she might have been joy, inspiration, and victory, had not the world been then as it is not now. The man, who as the light of the moonbeams fell upon him, showed me in his haggard and miserable features the spectral likeness of Santorus. Was it right, I asked myself, that the two perfect lines of a mutual love should be swept asunder? Or, if it was, as some might conceive it, right, according to certain temporary and conventional views of rightness, was it possible to so sever them? Would it not be well if we all occasionally remembered that there is an eternal law of harmony between souls as between spheres, and that if we ourselves bring about a divergence, we also bring about discord? And again, that if discord results by our intermeddling, it is against the law, and must by the working of natural forces be resolved into concord again, whether such resolvance takes ten, a hundred, a thousand, or ten thousand years. Of what use, then, is the struggle we are forever making in our narrow and limited daily lives to resist the wise and holy teachings of nature? Is it not best to yield to the insistence of the music of life while it sounds in our ears? for everything must come round to nature's way in the end, her way being God's way, and God's way the only way. So I thought, as in half-dreaming fashion, I watched the vision of the dead woman and her despairing lover fade into the impenetrable shadows of mystery, veiling the record of the light beyond. Presently I became conscious of a deep, murmuring sound like the subdued hum of many thousands of voices, and lifting my eyes, I saw the wide circular sweep of a vast arena crowded with people. In the center, 
and well to the front of the uplifted tiers of seats there was a gorgeous pavilion of gold draped with gaudy colored silk and hung with festoons of roses wherein sat a heavily built brutish-looking man royally robed and crowned and wearing jewels in such profusion as to seem literally clothed in flashing points of light beautiful women were gathered round him boys with musical instruments crouched at his feet attendants stood on every hand to minister to his slightest call or signal and all eyes were fixed upon him as upon some worshipped god of a nation's idolatry i felt and knew that i was looking upon the shadow presentment of the roman tyrant nero and i wondered vaguely how it chanced that he in all the splendor of his wild and terrible career of wickedness should be brought into this phantasmagoria of dream in which i and one other alone seemed to be chiefly concerned there were strange noises in my ears the loud din of trumpets the softer sound of harps played enchantingly in some far-off distance the ever-increasing loud buzzing of the voices of the multitude and then all at once the roar as of angry wild beasts in impatience or pain. The time of this vision seemed to be late afternoon. I thought I could see a line of deep rose color in a sky where the sun had lately set. The flare of torches glimmered all round the arena and beyond it, striking vivid brilliancy from the jewels on Nero's breast, and throwing into strong relief the groups of soldiers and people immediately around him. I perceived now that the centre of the arena, previously empty, had become the one spot on which the looks of the people began to turn. One woman stood there all alone, clad in white, her arms crossed on her breast. So still was she, so apparently unconscious of her position, that the mob, ever irritated by calmness, grew suddenly furious and a fierce cry arose. Ad Leones! Ad Leones! The great emperor stirred from his indolent, half-reclining position, and leaned forward with a sudden look of interest on his lowering features. And as he did so, a man attired in the costume of a gladiator entered the arena from one of its side doors, and with a calm step and assured demeanor walked up to the front of the royal dais, and there dropped on one knee then quickly rising he drew himself erect and waited his eyes fixed on the woman who stood as immovably as a statue apparently resigned to some untoward fate and again the vast crowd shouted ad leones ad leones there came a heavy grating noise of drawn bolts and bars the sound of falling chains then a savage animal roar and two lean and ferocious lions sprang into the arena, lashing their tails, their manes bristling and their eyes aglare. Quick as thought, the gladiator stood in their path, and I swiftly recognized the nature of the sport that had brought the emperor and all this brave and glittering show of humanity out to watch what to them was merely a sensation the life of a christian dashed out by the claws and fangs of wild beasts a common pastime all unchecked by either the mercy of man or the intervention of god i understood as clearly as if the explanation had been volunteered to me in so many words that the woman who awaited her death so immovably had only one chance of rescue and that chance was through the gladiator who to please the humor of the emperor, had been brought hither to combat and frighten them off their intended victim, the reward for him, if he succeeded, being the woman herself. I gazed with aching, straining eyes on the wonderful dream spectacle, and my heart thrilled as I saw one of the lions stealthily approach the solitary martyr and prepare to spring. Like lightning, the gladiator was upon the famished brute, fighting it back in a fierce and horrible contest, while the second lion, pouncing forward and bent on a similar attack, was similarly repulsed. 
the battle between man and beasts was furious prolonged and terrible to witness and the excitement became intense ad leones ad leones was now the universal wild shout rising even louder and louder into an almost frantic clamour the woman meanwhile never stirred from her place she might have been frozen to the ground where she stood she appeared to notice neither the lions who were ready to devour her nor the gladiator who combated them in her defence and i studied her strangely impassive figure with keen interest waiting to see her face for i instinctively felt i should recognize it presently as though in response to my thought she turned towards me and as in a mirror i saw my own reflected personality again as i had seen it so many times in this chain of strange episodes with which i was so singularly concerned though still an outside spectator between her shadow figure and what i felt of my own existing self there seemed to be a pale connecting line of light and all my being thrilled towards her with a curiously vague anxiety a swirling mist came before my eyes suddenly and when this cleared i saw that the combat was over the lions lay dead and weltering in their blood on the trampled sand of the arena, and the victorious gladiator stood near their prone bodies, triumphant, amid the deafening cheers of the crowd. Wreaths of flowers were tossed to him from the people, who stood up in their seats all round the great circle, to hail him with their acclamations, and the emperor, lifting his unwieldy body from under his canopy of gold, stretched out his hand as a sign that the prize which the dauntless combatant had fought to win was his he at once obeyed the signal but now the woman hitherto so passive and immovable stirred fixing upon the gladiator a glance of the deepest reproach and anguish she raised her arms warningly as though forbidding him to approach her and then fell face forward on the ground he rushed to her side and kneeling down sought to lift her then suddenly he sprang erect with a loud cry great emperor i asked of thee a living love and this is dead a ripple of laughter ran through the crowd the emperor leaned forward from his throne and smiled thank your christian god for that he said our pagan deities are kinder they give us love for love the gladiator gave a wild gesture of despair and turned his face upward to the light the face of santorus dead dead he cried of what use then is life dark are the beloved eyes cold is the generous heart the fight has been in vain my victory mocks me with its triumph the world is empty again the laughter of the populace stirred the air go to man and the rough voice of Nero sounded harshly above the murmurous din. The world was never the worse for one woman the less. Wouldst thou also be a Christian? Take heed, our lions are still hungry. Thy love is dead, tis true, but we have not killed her. She trusted in her God, and he has robbed thee of thy lawful possession. Blame him, not us. Go hence, with thy laurels bravely won. Nero commends thy prowess he flung a purse of gold at the gladiator's feet and then i saw the whole scene melt away into a confused mass of light and colour till all was merely a pearl-grey haze floating before my eyes yet i was hardly allowed a moment's respite before another scene presented itself like a painting upon the curtain of vapour which hung so persistently in front of me a scene which struck a closer chord upon my memory than any i had yet beheld the cool spacious interior of a marble pillared hall or studio slowly disclosed itself to my view it was open to an enchanting vista of terraced gardens and dark undulating woods and gay parterres of brilliant blossom were spread in front of it like a wonderfully patterned carpet of intricate and exquisite design within it was all the picturesque grace and confusion of an artist's surroundings and at a great easel working assiduously 
was one who seemed to be the artist himself, his face turned from me towards his canvas. Posed before him, in an attitude of indolent grace, was a woman, arrayed in clinging diaphanous drapery, a few priceless jewels gleaming here and there, like stars upon her bosom and arms, her hair falling in loose waves from a band of pale blue velvet fastened across it, was of a warm brown hue like an autumn leaf with the sun upon it, and I could see that whatever she might be, according to the strictest canons of beauty, the man who was painting her portrait considered her more than beautiful. I heard his voice in the low, murmurous, yet perfectly distinct way in which all sounds were conveyed to me in this dream pageant. It was exactly as if persons on the stage were speaking to an audience. If we could understand each other, he said, I think all would be well with us in time and eternity. There was a pause. The picturesque scene before me seemed to glow and gather intensity as I gazed. If you could see what is in my heart, he continued, you would be satisfied that no greater love was ever given to woman than mine for you. Yet I would not say I give it to you, for I have striven against it. He paused, and when he spoke again his words were so distinct that they seemed close to my ears. It has been wrung out of my very blood and soul. I can no more resist it than I can resist the force of the air by which I live and breathe. I ought not to love you. You are a joy forbidden to me. And yet I feel, rightly speaking, that you are already mine, that you belong to me as the other half of myself, and that this has been so from the beginning, when God first ordained the mating of souls. I tell you I feel this, but cannot explain it, and I grasp at you as my one hope of joy. I cannot let you go. She was silent, save for a deep sigh that stirred her bosom under its folded lace, and made her jewels sparkle like sunbeams on the sea. If I lose you now, having known and loved you, he went on, I lose my art. Not that this would matter. Her voice trembled on the air. It would matter a great deal, she said softly, to the world. The world, he echoed. What need I care for it? Nothing seems of value to me when you are not. I am nerveless, senseless, hopeless without you. My inspiration, such as it is, comes from you. She moved restlessly. Her face was turned slightly away, so that I could not see it. My inspiration comes from you, he repeated. The tender look of your eyes fills me with dreams which might, I do not say would, realize themselves in a life's renown. But all this is perhaps nothing to you. What, after all, can I offer you? Nothing but love. And here in Florence, you could command more lovers than there are days in the week, did you choose. But people say, you are untouchable by love, even at its best. Now I... Here he stopped abruptly and laid down his brush, looking full at her. I, he continued, love you at neither best nor worst, but simply and entirely with all of myself, all that a man can be in passionate heart, soul, and body. How the words rang out! I could have sworn they were spoken close beside me and not by dream voices in a dream. If you loved me, ah, God, what that would mean! If you dared to brave everything, if you had the courage of love to break down all barriers between yourself and me, but you will not do this. The sacrifice would be too great, too unusual. You think it would? The question was scarcely breathed. A look of sudden amazement lightened his face. Then he replied gently, I think it would. Women are impulsive, generous to a fault. They give what they afterwards regret. Who can blame them? You have much to lose by such a sacrifice as I should ask of you. I have all to gain. I must not be selfish, but I love you, and your love would be to me more than the hope of heaven. And now strange echoes of a modern poet's rhyme became mingled in my dream. You have chosen and clung to the chance they sent you, life sweet as perfume and pure as prayer. 
but will it not one day in heaven repent you? Will they solace you wholly the days that were? Will you lift up your eyes between sadness and bliss, meet mine and see where the great love is, and tremble and turn and be changed, content you, the gate is straight, I shall not be there. Yet I know this well, were you once sealed mine, mine in the blood's beat, mine in the breath, mixed into me as honey in wine not time that saith and gainsayeth nor all strong things had severed us then not wrath of gods nor wisdom of men nor all things earthly nor all divine nor joy nor sorrow nor life nor death i watched with a deepening thrill of anxiety the scene in the studio and my thoughts centred themselves upon the woman who sat there so quietly seeming all unmoved by the knowledge that she held a man's life and future fame in her hands. The artist took up his palette and brushes again, and began to work swiftly, his hand trembling a little. "'You have my whole confession now,' he said. "'You know that you are the eyes of the world to me, the glory of the sun and the moon. All my art is in your smile. All my life responds to your touch.' Without you, I am, I can be nothing. Cosmo de Medici. At this name, a kind of shadow crept upon the scene, together with a sense of cold. Cosmo de Medici, he repeated slowly. My patron would scarcely thank me for the avowals I have made to his fair ward, one whom he intends to honor with his own alliance. I am here by his order to paint the portrait of his future bride, not to look at her with the eyes of a lover, but the task is too difficult. A little sound escaped her, like a smothered cry of pain. He turned towards her. Something in your face, he said, a touch of longing in your sweet eyes, has made me risk telling you all, so that you may at least choose your own way of love and life for there is no real life without love. Suddenly she rose and confronted him, and once again, as in a magic mirror, I saw my own reflected personality. There were tears in her eyes, yet a smile quivered on her mouth. My beloved, she said, and then paused, as if afraid. A look of wonder and rapture came on his face like the light of sunrise and I recognized the now familiar features of Santoris. Very gently he laid down his palette and brushes and stood waiting in a kind of half-expectancy, half-doubt. My beloved, she repeated, have you not seen? Do you not know? Oh, my genius, my angel, am I so hard to read, so difficult to win? Her voice broke in a sob. She made an uncertain step forward, and he sprang to meet her. "'I love you, love you!' she cried passionately. "'Let the whole world forsake me, if only you remain. I am all yours. Do with me as you will.' He caught her in his arms, straining her to his heart, with all the passion of a long-denied lover's embrace. Their lips met, and for a brief space they were lost in that sudden and divine rapture that comes but once in a lifetime, when, like a shivering sense of cold, the name again was whispered. Cosmo de Medici! A shadow fell across the scene, and a woman, dark and heavy-featured, stood like a blot in the sunlit brightness of the studio. A woman very richly attired, who gazed fixedly at the lovers with round, suspicious eyes and a sneering smile. The artist turned and saw her, his face changed from joy to a pale anxiety. Yet, holding his love with one arm, he flung defiance at her with uplifted head and fearless demeanor. Spy, he exclaimed, do your worst. Let us have an end of your serpent vigilance and perfidy. Better death than the constant sight of you. What, have you not watched us long enough to make discovery easy? Do your worst, I say, and quickly. The cruel smile deepened on the woman's mouth. She made no answer, but simply raised her hand. In immediate obedience to the signal, a man, clad in the Florentine dress of the sixteenth century, and wearing a singular collar of jewels, 
stepped out from behind a curtain, attended by two other men who, by their dress, were, or seemed to be, of inferior rank. Without a word, these three threw themselves upon the unarmed and defenceless painter, with the fury of wild animals pouncing on prey. There was a brief and breathless struggle. Three daggers gleamed in air. A shriek rang through the stillness. Another instant and the victim lay dead, stabbed to the heart, while she who had just clung to his living body and felt the warmth of his living lips against hers, dropped on her knees beside the corpse with wild wailings of madness and despair. "'Another crime on your soul, Cosmo de' Medici!' she cried. "'Another murder of a nobler life than your own. May heaven curse you for it. But you have not parted my love from me. No, you have but united us for ever. We escape you and your spies, thus!' And snatching a dagger from the hand of one of the assassins, before he could prevent her, she plunged it into her own breast. She fell without a groan, self-slain, and I saw, as in a mist of breath on a mirror, the sudden horror on the faces of the men and the one woman who were left to contemplate the ghastly deed they had committed. And then, noting as in some old blurred picture the features of the man who wore the collar of jewels, I felt that I knew him, yet I could not place him in any corner of my immediate recognition. Gradually this strange scene of cool white marble vastness, with its brilliant vista of flowers and foliage under the bright Italian sky, and the betrayed lovers lying dead beside each other in the presence of their murderers, passed away like a floating cloud, and the same slow, calm voice I had heard once before now spoke again in sad, stern accents. Jealousy is cruel as the grave. The coals thereof are coals of fire, which hath a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. If a man would give all his substance for love, it would be utterly contemned. I closed my eyes, or thought I closed them. A vague terror was growing upon me, a terror of myself, and a still greater terror of the man beside me who held my hand. Yet something prevented me from turning my head to look at him, and another, still stronger emotion possessed me with a force so overpowering that I could hardly breathe under the weight and pain of it. But I could give it no name. I could not think at all, and I had ceased even to wonder at the strangeness and variety of these visions or dream episodes full of color and sound, which succeeded each other so swiftly. Therefore it hardly seemed remarkable to me when I saw the heavy curtain of mist which hung in front of my eyes, suddenly reft asunder in many places, and broken into a semblance of the sea. A wild sea, gloomily gray and grand in its on-sweeping wrath, its huge billows rose and fell like moving mountains convulsed by an earthquake. Light and shadow combated against each other in its dark, abysmal depths and among its toppling crests of foam. I could hear the savage hiss and boom of breakers dashing themselves to pieces on some unseen rocky coast far away, and my heart grew cold with dread as I beheld a ship in full sail struggling against the heavy onslaught of the wind on that heaving wilderness of waters like a mere feather lost from a seagull's wing. Flying along like a hunted creature, she staggered and plunged, her bowsprit dipping into deep chasms from which she was tossed shudderingly upward again as in light contempt. And as she came nearer and nearer into my view, I could discern some of the human beings on board, the man at the wheel with keen eyes peering into the gathering gloom of the storm, his hair and face dashed with spray, the sailors fighting hard to save the rigging from being torn to pieces and flung into the sea. Then a sudden huge wave swept her directly in front of me, and I saw the two distinct personalities that had been so constantly presented to me during this strange experience, the man with the face of Santorus, the woman with my own face so truly reflected, 
that I might have been looking at myself in a mirror. And just now the resemblance to us both was made more close and striking than it had been in any of the previous visions. That is to say, the likenesses of ourselves were given almost as we now existed. The man held the woman beside him closely clasped with one arm, supporting her and himself, with the other thrown round one of the shaking masts. I saw her look up to him with the light of a great and passionate love in her eyes, and I heard him say, The end of sorrow and the beginning of joy, you are not afraid? Afraid? And her voice had no tremor. With you? He caught her closer to his heart, and kissed her, not once, but many times, in a kind of mingled rapture and despair. This is death, my beloved and her answer pealed out with tender certainty. No, not death, but life and love. A cry went up from the sailors, a cry of heart-rending agony. A mass of enormous billows rolling steadily on together hurled themselves like giant assassins upon the frail and helpless vessel and engulfed it. It disappeared with awful swiftness, like a small blot on the ocean sucked down into the whirl of water. The vast and solemn grayness of the sea spread over it like a pall. It was a nothing, gone into nothingness. I watched one giant wave rise in a crystalline glitter of dark sapphire and curl over the spot where all that human life and human love had disappeared. And then there came upon my soul a sudden sense of intense calm. The great sea smoothed itself out before my eyes, into fine ripples, which dispersed gradually into mist again. And almost I found my voice, almost my lips opened to ask, What means this vision of the sea? When a sound of music checked me on the verge of utterance, the music of delicate strings as of a thousand harps in heaven, I listened with every sense caught and entranced my gaze still fixed half unseeingly upon the heavy gray film which hung before me, that mystic sky canvas upon which some divine painter had depicted in lifelike form and color scenes which I, in a sort of dim strangeness, recognized yet could not understand. And as I looked, a rainbow with every hue intensified to such a burning depth of brilliancy that its light was almost intolerably dazzling, sprang in a perfect arch across the cloud. I uttered an involuntary cry of rapture, for it was like no earthly rainbow I had ever seen. Its palpitating radiance seemed to penetrate into the very core and center of space, aerially delicate yet deep. Each separate color glowed with the fervent splendor of a heaven undreamed of, by mere mortality, and too glorious for mortal description. It was the shining repentance of the storm, the assurance of joy after sorrow, the passionate love of the soul rising upwards in perfect form and beauty after long imprisonment in ice-bound depths of repression and solitude. It was anything and everything that could be thought or imagined of divinest promise. My heart beat quickly. Tears sprang to my eyes, and almost unconsciously I pressed the kind, strong hand that held mine. It trembled ever so slightly, but I was too absorbed in watching that triumphal arch across the sky to heed the movement. By degrees the lustrous hues began to pale very slowly, and almost imperceptibly they grew fainter and fainter, till at last all was misty gray as before save in one place where there were long rays of light like the falling of silvery rain. And then came strange, rapidly passing scenes as of cloud forms constantly shifting and changing, in all of which I discerned the same two personalities, so like and yet so unlike ourselves, who were the dumb witnesses of every episode. But everything now passed in absolute silence. There was no mysterious music. The voices had ceased. All was mute. Suddenly there came a change over the face of what I thought the sky. The clouds were torn asunder, as it were, 
to show a breadth of burning amber and rose, and I beheld the semblance of a great closed gateway, barred across as with gold. Here a figure slowly shaped itself, the figure of a woman who knelt against the closed barrier, with hands clasped and uplifted in pitiful beseeching. So strangely desolate and solitary was her aspect, in all that heavenly brilliancy, that I could almost have wept for her, shut out as she seemed, from some mystic unknown glory. Round her swept the great circle of the heavens. Beneath her and above her were the deserts of infinite space, and she, a fragile soul, rendered immortal by quenchless fires of love and hope and memory, hovered between the deeps of immeasurable vastness like a fluttering leaf or flake of snow. My heart ached for her, my lips moved unconsciously in prayer. Oh, leave her not always exiled and alone, I murmured inwardly. Dear God, have pity. Unbar the gate and let her in. She has waited so long. The hand holding mine strengthened its clasp, and the warm, close pressure sent a thrill through my veins. Almost, I would have turned to look at my companion, had I not suddenly seen the closed gateway in the heavens begin to open slowly, allowing a flood of golden radiance to pour out like the steady flowing of a broad stream. The kneeling woman's figure remained plainly discernible, but seemed to be gradually melting into the light which surrounded it. And then, something, I know not what, shook me down from the pinnacle of vision, hardly aware of my own action, I withdrew my hand from my companions and saw just the solemn grandeur of Loch Corisk, with a deep amber glow streaming over the summit of the mountains, flung upward by the setting sun. Nothing more. I heaved an involuntary sigh, and at last, with some little hesitation and dread, looked full at Santoris. His eyes met mine steadfastly. He was very pale. So we faced each other for a moment. Then he said quietly, How quickly the time has passed. This is the best moment of the sunset. When that glory fades, we shall have seen all. End of chapter 8